This is On The Wire, Racing TV's podcast for the best racing previews in association with Bar One Racing. You're welcome along to a special episode of On The Wire with none other than Jessica Harrington about to join us despite uh, a self-apparent uh, aversion to technology. There's absolutely nothing wrong with Jess's ability to take a Zoom call or to train horses uh, to win top races, which she may at Ascot uh, next week, and which she may on a global level, it turns out. Uh, so tune into that interview coming up shortly. It's myself, Johnny Ward. It is John McDonald from our sponsors, Bar One Racing, Fran Berry and... Brendan Duke and lads, we've had a bit of sunshine this week. Everyone's in better form, mm. including you, Dukey, apart from a trip to the bike shop, I believe. Yeah, well, a trip to the bike shop and a trip to the dentist. So I've been shelling out money left, right and centre uh, over, over the week. But luckily, the ponies are treating me kindly. So they, 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 that's that's easing the pain. My golfers aren't going great. Uh, but uh, yeah, they, they, Things are, are relatively positive, but the trip to the bike shop was, was an awful shop because I thought I was only going to be spending a fiver and I ended up spending 150 quid so uh, big windows in that shop Johnny big windows and, and not only that Johnny Mac but he has to he has to climb uh, on the bike to get to his brothers so that he has a proper 4G for this Zoom call yeah what amazes me uh, Juki how do you think these people are meant to run their businesses <laughs> fiver for a yeah. visit to my shop <laughs> 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 But not, not gauging the customer, Johnny, by using the pretext to health and safety. That's the problem with health and safety. Very expensive business. Very mm. expensive. Brian, <laughs> you're in the, um, they, Go on, Juki. They've never heard the phrase shirt and be grand on the continent, have they? Your mom, your mom's a European. Nothing's ever grand over there. Everything has to be by the book. <laughs> It turns out if you if you do cycle, you, you actually do start spending a fair bit of money on repairs. But uh, Fran, there was, you didn't need any repairs. You look great, I thought, there at Leopardstown, yourself and Kev, uh, resplendent in the sunshine for uh, yesterday's meet. Yeah, that uh, came about by accident. Kevin um, pitched up at my house to go racing with me in a suit. I was in my jeans and blazer ready to rock up. And uh, <laughs> I had to run upstairs, get changed, fired a tie into the, into the suit jacket and uh, both went on air with matching ties almost. So, uh, yeah, that created a bit of a, a little bit of stir on Twitter. So it's uh, good to see everybody's watching anyway. And it took the shine off all the losers we probably gave on eight race cards. So, yeah, all good. <laughs> Some mad results, to be fair. Speaking of which, here are the naps from last weekend. Um, Juki, you tipped Japan. Let's start yeah. with that. It was disappointing. I have to say, it I was. thought this was one of the most compelling races to watch this season. Martin Dwyer, obviously, um, of the Racing TV stable, uh, has, you know, he's probably not going to enjoy many races more than this. But Japan didn't particularly enjoy the, Ep- the Epsom Challenge on Friday. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I got... I- you know, I thought it was a soft lead on and in the end the rag went up and, and made it and I don't think Ryan did anything wrong on Japan but again he didn't look to have a whole lot, lot of fight in him so uh, he's a horse who's cost me a lot of money and I may I may have to draw some but as you say an absolutely compelling race because I, I thought that Dwyer, that pile driver is a tricky horse but mm. I thought that, that, that Dwyer didn't give him a, a good ride. I thought he should have won the ledger last year, but that was an exceptional ride. I mean, he's made that mid-race move just when things are calming down. And in the end, that horse really needs a rail to roll against. So he's fairly he game, obviously, because he duped it out, but he's a bit quirky. Like The jockey made the difference there, I think. Fran, I watched the derby coming downhill in the Blasket Islands. Uh, so I watched the race on 4G in an uninhabited island, and it was kind of we're walking down towards the beach and the beach is full of like, there's about 200 seals on the beach. It's an incredible sight, but you can get in and have a swim. But as I was walking down, I have to watch the derby here and Bolshoi Ballet was coming down the hill. Seemingly everything had been going to plan, got into a great position and your nap, obviously him into high definition for the ledger. It just goes to show the amount of things that can go wrong in a race. He could have backed this horse at 33s last year, um, which I really regretted not doing because I loved him when he won his maiden and I was gutted I hadn't backed him all year. And then it just all goes completely peat on the race. It shows you uh, the best operation in the world to depend on one horse and it goes goes wrong doesn't it and they uh, you know they don't leave any stone on unfur- on turn Dana O'Brien and Bally Doyle and the lads and uh, it, uh, it was too bad to be true wasn't it if he finished fourth fifth you'd say okay he came up short but it was too bad a run he's got that little cut in his leg whether that cost him or not maybe it was ground funny race um the derby anything that was in near the rail the first and second were hard to rail most of the way 
and that seemed to pay dividends. Obviously, Kirby got a great run. Adam Kirby, a great win for him. Up the rail and the second day, Richard Hannon's only had to come around one or two horse in the straight. And that seemed to, I don't know, maybe prove somewhat of an advantage. That said, though, the winner was very good. And uh, I think we just have to run into high definition for the ledger now at five or six to one before he wins the Irish Derby, Johnny. Yeah, that's that's fair enough. And uh, we will actually look back on those two races very shortly. Um, standing in for you last week, John, I thought who, who actually upstaged you, really. He gave a very good winning nap in Snowfall, who produced an extraordinary performance, which we'll shortly look at. But uh, Will played a starring role. Yeah, she was phenomenal, Johnny. Uh, last year, she was middle of the road, you'd have thought, amongst the Valley Doyle juvenile fillies. She won one of, was it five or six starts? She was hammered in a debutant, hammered in the Philly mm. pile. Michael as well was inside it, then produced that in the Missy Dora, and then in the Oaks, 16 lengths, nobody could have predicted. Absolutely extraordinary. I was um I was watching the Oaks also whilst traveling around Kerry and having um I was asked to prepare a little bit of groundwork for this DBC documentary on Shergar. Um, that's actually edited, that's actually narrated by um, Vanilla Ice of all things. But I had to listen to the first uh, podcast because it's just like a seven part series. And obviously there were the, the, the commentary of Shergar winning the Derby. And in the middle of it, I paused to watch the Oaks and it was a similar performance. At a lesser level, my nap was Justino, who did get the job done, obviously, at the stall, but it was actually turned over uh, at Limerick subsequently, or sorry, at Leopardstown last night. Let's get to the, the actual though from Epsom over the weekend three unbelievable races on many levels Fran you probably uh, I don't know you attracted a bit of attention by by questioning Frankl's stud career so far he's the first and the third in the derby now this was definitely a day of deliverance for him a very very impressive winner as well yeah look it was coming I suppose but uh, he had to go and deliver and he did Julie did in great style um, good to see uh, the generation Frankel and see stars coming through isn't it at this level Galileo you know it, what, whatever time he's left at the top of his game um, the winner was very good though Johnny um, I know he did a great run around well back before the off mm. there seemed to be plenty of money late on from running sand down a couple of stars ago was very good and uh, he looked a proper horse you know there's no taking away from the way, manner in which he done it I wish he was coming for the Irish Derby as he's going for the King George. Yeah. But uh, look, he's he's a high class prospect. Charlie Appleby doesn't miss in them big races nowadays. He's really developed into a, a proper Group One trainer. Did you do your dawn the race, Duke, or had you any involvement? No, the only bet I had was the Haggis horse uh, who, mm. who, who who was pulled out. So in the, in the end, I left it. But I, I mean, I wouldn't have backed the winner. As, as Fran said, I I thought he was a good thing in Linkfield because he ran against a couple of biases in. Sandnev, it was a pace bias and a rail bias. He was definitely the best horse in Sandnev. And I thought he'd win in Linkfield. And then maybe didn't handle the track. But I, I mean, that, that's a, an excuse I'm struggling with because then he looks so comfortable in Epsom and Linkfield and, and, and Epsom are very similar tracks. So I, I don't know what to make of the race. I mean, the second was 50 to one. The thirds pulled a couple of shoes off. McSweeney, well, I don't think he's that good anyway, but I mean, he definitely didn't like the undulations. Um, I, I wouldn't have a lot of confidence in, in, in the form of that race. It was interesting you were so against um, the Santa Barbara. Um, she actually touched nearly even money in running, which is quite extraordinary, really. It, it, it was a race in which she was well beaten, but she actually did shape well, I thought. Yeah, well, she did settle well, didn't you? Because mm. when she went down to the start with her mouth open, I thought, oh, oh she's just going to pull her race away. And now Ryan was at pains to get her settled. And I, I had that race very completely wrong. There was loads of pace. Fran suggested there would be, and there was loads of pace on in the race, which helped him. But I thought Ryan did a great job to get her settled. And she did seem to fail pretty well. She may not have stayed, but again, I don't think she likes it up for Johnny. I really, I don't think she's genuine. I don't think she likes it up for yet. Johnny Mack, what were your thoughts on the, on the classics? Um, Adi Yar, I thought, was good. I, 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 what really struck me was the outpouring of goodwill for Adam Kirby after the race. Mm. And you might know him. He seems a really nice chap. But from all his fellow colleagues, there seemed to be a genuine uh, delight for him. Yeah, Adam Kirby, a very, very popular guy. Um, there's no easy day for him to go racing, lads. Every day he goes racing, he's got to take off a, a good bit of weight. Maybe no more so than a lot of lads, but... He does it day in, day out, never complains, and a very good rider and somebody that's 
being pigeonholed unfairly as an all weather jockey just mm. because he stays in England, he can't travel with his weight. He's got to thrive in pre training business in Newmarket also, and uh, he just rides away all weather through the wind to keep fit. Um, but look at his record for Clive Cox over the years um, in Group One company, and he got an opportunity in a proper race, like a proper classic mile and a half, and he gave him some ride because that gap on the rail. It wasn't really there, was it? It was only just a half a gap and it could have been all over in a split second there with that camber. If the horse in front of him rolled back in an inch, it was game over for Adi Arab. But he, Adam committed to the gap. He had plenty of horse under him, but the easy thing would have been to do, come round him and take your chance then. But he was straight into it and uh, instinctive and uh, class right. Do you, do you think he'd have been shouting and roaring at Ben Curtis, Fran? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And that's one upside to no crowd there because when you turn into Epsom down the hill and five furlongs out in a normal year, you cannot hear anything around you because the crowd is inside you, it's outside you, it's wall deep with a uh, double decker buses. I've never heard of Wallace and look at an Epsom, but this year, uh, with no infield crowd, uh, he definitely would have been, uh, would have been shouting and would have been heard. Do you like how does your confidence affect you as a jockey friend? Because like when, when your confidence is low, do you become averse to taking sort of the gaps that might be there briefly? Do you, you know, averse to risk taking, I guess? Um, I suppose I suppose when things are happening, everything seems to happen, and when it's not not nothing seems to happen with the best will in the world and, and uh Mick Canan had a great saying, if 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 you hesitate or think about it, you're gone anyway, you know. So, mm. you know, when think, when you're thinking about things, it's not going to happen because the gap is closed and that. And, uh, you know, when you're riding at that level, you just can't afford to take a, you know, take a second guess. And uh, that's what made the difference with Adam on Saturday. What, what would, just briefly, lads, any horse that you take out the weekend at the prices that we have now for the arc? Because, like, if, if Bolshoi Ballet were to return to form, I think he's 25s for the arc or something like that. Obviously, there is a question mark. The injury mightn't be great. Um, but then you have the performance of Snowfall. She'll be a three-year-old filly getting all the allowances. I'll start with you, Fran, actually. Uh, if you're going to back one for the arc, it's only Snowfall. You can mm. back a three-year-old filly, 55 kilos, eight stone, nine, the weight for age, High class fillies, um, we've seen it over the years how that can be such an edge in an arc. And uh, uh, Japan hasn't had a group, um, hasn't had an arc winner yet, but they might have one in a, a link through that with uh, the Sir Deep Impact come October. Uh, she's the only one at the minute. I yeah, well, it was it was mad, Dukey, seeing the the Deep Impact. Um, and I think as uh, I think as Will was saying, Snowfall did have. Um, she had the pedigree for the job on the dam side as well, but deep impact. I remember what he railing on the arc, he was favorite him, but that race will always be for me, will always be you know remembered by the fact that all the Japanese came over, they uh, hammered him the toe, didn't give a damn what uh, price he was. I was there that day, mm. and uh, a lot of the Japanese guys were buying tote, they were having a bet on the tote, but they weren't going to cash the vouchers in, they were going to take them home and have them break. Which they may have done anywhere. They may have dried their tears with them, but they're they're incredible fans. Uh, because I arrived, I arrived about an hour before race, and like, like by Irish standards, that's arriving the day before. <laughs> and the Japan, the Japanese were all there, and uh, it, it, you see that in the Japan Cup, and they all flood in as soon as the gates open. So they're incredible fans, and they they do have an incredible record of traveling horses, and now Deep Impact have an influence. On European, it was a very interesting weekend for Sawyer's actually, wasn't it? Because he, Kumar had that experiment with sending pivotal mares to Galileo, which was very successful. And then, now they're trying to send uh, Galileo mares to Siuni, a son of pivotal. And mm. lo and behold, the Basilica only goes and bolts up in the French Derby. It might be, probably is the best three year old Cote Naz. So, very, very interesting times in that breeding, Johnny. A holy performance by St. Mark's Basilica, obviously. But what sort of odds are we talking for the arc in general, John? Uh, Love, I'm just looking at it here. Love is favourite at the moment. She's 7 to 1. Obviously, she's in the um, Prince of Wales's next week. I think they've armoury in that as well. I'm not sure whether she'll pitch up. Next week should tell a lot uh, with Love. We're 8, Mishrit and uh, Dermot Wells, Philly, Tarnawa. 9 is the French Derby winner, St. Mark's Basilica. And uh, 10 to 1, Bar Belcher Valley in their 25s. Let's get to Jessica Harrington, the Lady of Moon, uh, probably most known for Moscow Flyer and all that, but she's kind of just rewritten her own um, sort of, I, I guess, her autobiography with a lot of chapters to write. Let's get to Jessica. 
This is On The Wire, Racing TV's podcast for the best racing previews in association with Bar One Racing. Jessica Harrington, how are you getting on? We're getting on great. I'm delighted that the rain has stopped and we've got a bit of nice weather, which is making me feel much better. Yeah, I don't think you're alone there. I think we're all in better form and you're in better form after Real Appeal um, step company it was actually quite brilliant that turn of foot that he loves to show at Leopardstown was evident again in the Bally Chorus last night yeah he was very good you know and I just thought you know stepping straight from a handicap company even though he did he did win as a, a listed race as a two year old mm. uh, stepping from handicap company you know which he had been very disappointing in, but we we seem to have got him back this winter. He seems to just thrive, and he, he's been very good so far. And he just um just all clicked last night, and he loves Leopardstown. How have you found the season so far? Ah, it, it's been good. It's been a bit frustrating because the weather has been changing. You know, it was very dry all through April, and then it was very wet during May and cold, and the horses didn't really thrive very well when the weather was very cold. Especially the Phillies. Mm. Do you do you find like that horses this time of year now when the you're getting a spell of good weather that they do react favorably towards it? Oh, they do. They love it. You know, you suddenly see their coats all coming and they they just look happier. They just they, they're a bit like me. They don't like being cold. No, but one thing you weren't cold on was your record with Fran Berry. Do you remember your relationship with him? Oh well, I do indeed. We had a lot of fun. He he rode my first Group One winner. Pat Fork was it? Yep. Fran, do you remember those days? Oh, God, I do, yeah. We did some great times together. Um, a lot of winners and a lot of success. Pat Forked up was special, wasn't it? It was, uh, uh, he was a bit of a freak. That he ended up in the yard initially, uh, very well-bred. And, uh, God, he didn't let us down. Even when the ground was against him that day, Jesse and the Curry, he'd done enough to be Casamento. We won a group one afterwards, you know, so great day. Oh, it was great. And I have his half-sister this year. I was just going to ask you about her. That was a uh, about her and also Alpha Centuri's sister. They ran really well at Leopardstown, Jesse. That was a good run. I was delighted with discoveries. Uh, absolutely delighted. She's she's a funny filly. She looks at everything and she has to take everything in. And she just was very green because having jumped very well that day, she then said, "Oh, what are all these horses doing around me?" Mm. She came home well, so I'm very happy with her, and I'm very happy, been very happy with her since. Yeah. You go to the Curry Derby weekend with her for a maiden or a list race or something? Uh, I'd say we'll probably go for a maiden. I'd like to win a maiden first mm-hmm. and then we can step up, take baby steps, I think. How did your relationship start in terms of Fran riding for you? Uh, God, I can't remember Fran. You were always around and, and you, you, you sometimes were available to ride my horses and I liked the way you rode. Simple <laughs> as that. Exactly, yeah. yeah. We used to ride a lot of work for Jesse and uh, just developed from there, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and in, in terms of um, Royal Ascot, obviously, Fran, I'm going to hand it over to you now because a lot of people ask me about your star through your Lucky Vega, obviously. But uh, Fran, you can take it from here. Jesse, Lucky Vega, obviously a great run in the English Guineas. Very, very impressive run. He surely stayed the mile. I thought he ran really well at the car on ground. He obviously hated it because he looked too far and out like he was going to be last. I couldn't believe he finished four to the death. I know. I thought I actually nearly put my grace glasses down. I thought, oh my God, he's going to be <laughs> mm. tailed off last. He absolutely hated it. Uh, but it proved to me there that uh, in that race on bad ground, he still stayed the mile well and, and you know, was, was, was closing in at the death to be fourth when I thought he was going to be out the back. It did. And uh, going to ride Ascot, obviously, you have a limited time with this horse star, right? Is he still going to Australia to be a stallion in August? Well, as far as I know, he is. Yeah, I don't, you know, we'll just see what happens. I just, at, the, at this stage of his career, I just take one step at a time. But he came out of the car really well, and I'm happy with it. A mile around a bend in the St. James's Palace, that should suit him well. And would you be inclined to ride him more like he, you know, he stays a mile now in comparison to his last two runs? Yeah, most likely we'll be a bit closer to the pace. Um, you know, he, he wasn't that far off the base because he was just actually in, in, in Newmarket. He just tracked away there. Um, but he just got a little bit of unbalance coming down the hill in Newmarket, which he had done in the Middle Park last mm. year as well. Mm. Definitely. And uh, you see Poetic Flair is favourite for the race. His form, if you go back to that road course at uh, Newmarket, and uh, he'd be quite hopeful going there. He's been all right since, in good form since the Irish Guineas. It might first be in great form. Uh, we, he's done his work here we're all on schedule he's just got one more breeze to do and then he'll be ready to be, turn up on Tuesday in Ascot 
plenty to look forward to. And Jesse, looking through the rest of the runners for the week, you have plenty of entries. Taipan, will he go for the Queen's Vase or will you keep him for uh, the Curra? I'm going to go for the Queen's Vase um, because Fiona Carmichael, who owns him, is able to go to Ascot. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether she'll be able to come over to the Curra. So she might as well see, she's never seen the horse run yet. So um, I think that's the obvious thing. And I'm going to fit him with a pair of blinkers because mm. he races very lazily. That's all. He's not the fact that he's not genuine. He's just he's a, he, he's a big, idle horse. Yeah, we were all over him the last time, Jesse. I think Fran had him as his nap, and uh, Fran is on a mission retrieval, I think. <laughs> I've been costing your money, Fran, have I? <laughs> uh, look, I'll keep to fate. Uh, I do think he wants a trip, uh, and uh, the blinkers are not a bad move. Does he want the ground as soft as it was at the Curry? Because I know he won his main at Nace on it, but maybe no extremes in going would be best for him or not? Or? I think probably no extremes. Um, I just hope it's not too. Uh, ah, look, it'll be it'll be a good covering of grass on it in Ascot, and and it'll be same for everyone, and so it's it's usually fair ground. And uh, Jesse, on Wednesday, if uh, Albion Square entered up and Valeria Messalina, would they be likely likely to go over and take their chances in their races? Yeah, uh, 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 Albion Square. F- firstly, he's actually in the sale, the the, the Goffs London sale on Monday night, the online sale. And then so he, he goes through the ring ostensibly there. And then uh, I would say he most likely it'll be the Albin. He's a, he's a very quick horse. He seems to like quick ground. Um, and he's come on. He's come on a lot since his last run when he won. Excellent. Valeria. Valeria. Yeah, she's uh, definitely going. Um, I took her out earlier on at the, at, at, at the car early on because the ground was too soft. And then I had to be committed to run her at, at um, the Guineas weekend, even though it was even worse ground uh, because I needed to get a run into her. She's quite a burly filly. Um, and so that brought her on great. And so she's in great form and the quicker the ground, the better she'll like it. Excellent. And uh, just Nord, if they mentored up in a couple of races through the week, uh, he was a great winner at, on Champions Day there last year, running extremely well in Haydock around the bend the last day in that group three. Yeah, you know, he really proved to me last day that he was a, he was a group uh, horse. Um, I was actually, he ran, I thought, there above himself. Um, and because it was a competitive group three, he just, the ground would be the problem really with him. Um, I don't sure whether he will go. I'd love to run him in the Hunt Cup because I think he lo- he loves that straight mile at Hampstead. Mm. And just on our Jesse, uh, we're obviously an Irish based show and we're all Irish connections. Uh, he he didn't win in Galway last year. He was pipped twice in the week, but just shows how competitive it is to win a good handicap in Ireland when you're dealing with a horse that bolted up in Ascot on Champions Day and as a group three performed this season. It's just so competitive here. It's very, very competitive. He just was very unlucky he, in Galway. He probably, he, he's his own worst enemy because he's a bit slow to jump and warm up into the race. Uh, but then when he gets going, he always finishes very strong. Um, but that's his style of racing. Um, and that's probably why it suits him when, uh, when they go really hard and he can come through from behind. So the English style of racing w- does suit him. Mm, yeah, and uh, just uh, how competitive it is to be win a good handicap here on a day in day out. It just uh, shows you what you need to win a good race here. Yeah, look, it, it's the same really probably with Real Appeal last night. Like he he won a good handicap and then was third in a handicap and then can come out and win a Group Three. You know, they are very competitive the handicaps. Very much so. And uh, Jesse, interesting coronation. If Un- Unadata, am I pronouncing that right? Uh, entered up. Yeah, in the coronation. Unadata. There's another another syllable in there. (laughs) Would would she be likely to go? Unadatar is a town in the middle of Australia somewhere. Mm. I think it's where it's hottest. He used to train a horse called Ulan Batar as well. He's the capital of Mongolia and was a good chaser in his day. Yeah, yeah, that was right too, yeah. And does Ulan Batar run? Uh, Yes, she does. She goes for the coronation. Um, She uh, ran in the Breeders' Cup last year. Uh, having finished third in the Moy Glare, she got upset in the stalls, which didn't help her. Um, and she always runs very fresh. She won her maiden fresh. So um, she seems to be in great form. And, and the quicker the ground, the better she'll like it. Is 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 she an inspiration to you, Duki, in that kind of a little bit later in her career, she slightly changed tact and became a world-class flat trainer as well as a jumps trainer? Because your own career has been sort of, I don't know, you're, you're, you're looking for the next step, I suppose. But we're always the first step. Yeah. <laughs> 
I'm not giving up yet. Uh, I'm always looking for the next step. Yeah, I know. Always, I look forward and hope. You know, I, look. You, all I want to do is, you know, have nice horses and train winners, and then, you know, then once you get to winners, you want group listed winners, group winners, group ones. You know, it's. It, I'm always sort of, you know, wanting to to do better and and try and do do the job better. This is probably a stupid question, but you must be actually looking forward to going over to Royal Ascot and enjoying people be racing again. Well, I'm not really enjoying it because I, you, you can go, I can go as two things. I can go as a participant, which means I'm a trainer and I can't mix with the spectators. Okay. Um, and tr- I can saddle my horse and I can go into the parade ring, but I can't mix with, can't go to boxes, can't go to lunch. Um, or I can go as a trainer spectator, which means I don't saddle the horse. I haven't worked out whether I'm allowed in the parade ring yet. But I can meet my owners, which is what I want to do. So well, I'm, I'm, I'm working out that I'm doing one thing one day and another thing, another uh, the other thing, the other uh, the other couple of days. Have you found all this quite frustrating? Uh, look, it is what it is. And, and look, the great thing, as long as we can keep racing going, look, we'll do anything. You know, if we had, had to stop racing, you know, like we did last spring, you know, it'd be a disaster. And like I was only thinking the other day, uh, this time last year, we'd only just literally started racing. We didn't start racing till the 8th of June. Mm, mm. Any questions for her, Juki and John? Well, I suppose just it, with, in terms of the general faffery of, of being at the races and whether you're a trainer, spectator, or spectator, trainer, but is it getting any easier to get the horses over there, Jesse? Or do you still have to have people to meet them on the other side? Or are those regulations being relaxed at all? I know that it's, it has got easier. Um, and now uh, the, your, your lorry driver doesn't have to do quarantine when he comes home. Um, uh, and it has got easier. They've re- re- lifted a good few restrictions, but it's still complicated because of n- not through COVID, but through um, Brexit. The fact that the, we have more, much more paperwork, it costs, it, it costs more money. The guts of, I think the paperwork now costs something like 900 euros. Get a horse well, over and back by the time you've told you, and that's just paperwork and a vet signing a form and the Department of Agriculture signing a form. It's crazy. Before we just, we just got on the boat and went. And that's per horse, is it? 900 quid? Per, per horse. Hmm. It's crazy. Um, but anyway, look, you know, it, it's, it's, it is what it is, and there's nothing we can do about it. It's still just the way it is. But, you know, if we could ever go back to what we had before. We had the tripart agreement that horses mm. could move freely between England, France, and Ireland. Um, but you know, there's, there's a VAT problem and, and having to. I don't, I luckily, I don't have anything to do with that part of the paperwork, but mm. I know it's it's complicated. And also, you have to make up if you know before it was great, you could actually wait until you had the 48 hour de- declarations if you weren't going too far into England and you could. See where you were drawn. Yeah, I want to go. Uh, we'll now ship him. But now, you know, I, I, I keep getting told four or five days before the race, are you going? And I said, well, I don't know. The ground might change. The draw might be bad. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, so it's just made it's just made it a bit more difficult, which is annoying. Johnny Mack? Do you find training flat horses, Jessica, brings more pressure? Uh, training any horse, if you put yourself under pressure, it is pressure because, you know, you basically want any horse you train, you want them to perform to the their best of their abilities. Um, training horses, look, it, train, whether you're training a horse to go to Cheltenham, Aintree, Punchestown Festival, the Grand Irish Grand National, whatever, it's the same pressure as you've got uh, when you go to all the big meetings. You've got, uh, uh, you know, you've got Aspid, you've got the Guineas over here, the Irish Derby Weekend. You're, you're under, you know, you, if you're like me, you want to succeed. So therefore, you, you probably do put yourself under pressure. Mm. Yeah, I, I guess my question, did you feel um, that, did you feel any way kind of intimidated by the challenge of training? Look at every, look at the men's run in Ireland, from even from country tracks to Leopardstown. You have the best bred horses and unbelievable pedigrees. Aidan O'Brien has access to Galileo's and you've taken, you know, the likes of Aidan, Derma Weld and so on, Jim Bull, you've taken it on head on and succeeded hugely in the, in the years you've done it as well. Uh, I always think that, you know, I, I basically, I think you always must strive to be better. Mm. So my, my attitude was, okay, they've probably got the best horses. I've got to, I've got to get the best out of my horses. Mm. And, you know, and, and 
you know, always be looking to get better and better. Um, you know, I, what I can't take is people say, oh, it's so competitive, you've got no chance. You've always got a chance. You've got to take mm. this on and do the best you can. You know, you could say the same thing in the jumping. You know, you've got you've Gordon Elliott, you've got William Mullins, you've got Henry de Bromhead, you know, all got a lot of firepower, a lot of money behind them to buy the best horses. You've still got to go out and take them on. And when you can take them on, you take them on. What um, race would you love to win most now? Uh, sorry? What race would you most like to win now that you haven't won? I haven't won. Well, I want to win a derby. Mm. I want to win an Ark. I want to win a King George. Not asking um, for a lot. I'm <laughs> asking. I, uh, why not? You've got yeah. to, if you don't keep looking forward and wanting to do, to achieve, you know, you might as well give up. Because if you're looking back and say, oh, I can't do that. Or I can't do this. Look, I'd love to win a group race in Australia. I'd love to win a group race in Hong Kong. They're all, you know, this is the worldwide in America. You know, it, there's a whole lot of, there's a whole big, big world out there that, you know, I'd love to take on. That's amazing. I was hoping you were going to say I'd love to win a Limerick race course handicap of 15 and a half grand because my nap is protagonist uh, running on Saturday. Would you give him a reasonable chance after his lovely comeback run at Nace? Uh, I would, yep. Well, I just hope the ground isn't too far from it. It's my only worry. But, you know, he's a fine horse. He got a good season last year. He just probably has gone a bit high up in the weights, but he had a nice right comeback run. So we're looking forward to that at the weekend. She's quite a remarkable woman, Fran. She is indeed. You know, it's uh, inspiring to hear the way Jesse's talking there about new challenges and everything. And Jesse, you mentioned the King George. Kim Peppers entered in. She made a good comeback in the Tats Gold Cup. Would you go pretty poly before that? Yeah, she goes to the Pretty Polly next. She just wants this ground. She doesn't want it too, too, um, too soft and doesn't want it too firm. But she's come back a stronger filly this year. Um, I think, you know, I think she's a better filly this year. So, look, it'd be lovely to win a group one with her. Um, whether we can do that, maybe taking on the boys is, is a step too far. But sometimes, you know, last year that race turned up not to be the strongest of races. Mm. But, you know, we'll just have to see what happens. And, and Jesse, just you mentioned the paperwork and uh, all the things going to train a big team of horses, delegation, teamwork. You've got Kate, you've got Emma, uh, you've got Richie there. Does that just leave you to train the horses? You don't have to worry about the paperwork, anything else. You just get down to the gallops. Yeah, that's basically it. And basically what happens is, thank God, they don't, I, they don't let me near any paperwork. And they don't mm. let me near any hiring and firing and anything else, time schedules and lists for this and lists for that. I'm not great at these, all these lists. I just like training the horses, looking at the horses, um, looking at the entries, looking at what races are qualified. For sure, and Crow who works in my office, I practically every morning go into them and say, would you see what seven furlong races are available for that horse? See, mm -hmm. see where we could go with this one. And he's great. He produces a bit of paper. And he puts it on my uh, on my desk, and I can then see where where I might be going. And you know, I listen. Everybody here works very hard, you know, and everyone pulls their weight in the yard. And and I'm very lucky to have it. So I, you know, I finally learned how to navigate. It took me a long time, but yeah, I finally. Think, yeah, I think that it's it's massively important. To what your special talent is it? Known basically known when a horse is right, seen in a horse in a piece of work that yeah, she's she's just ready and and known known her intimate kind of details almost from from known her in the out or whatever. Uh, a lot of it's gut instinct. I don't mm. know. Sometimes I don't know why I do things. Um, and it, I just suppose it's just a, it's an instinct or feeling you get or you think that's the right thing to do. We I, and mind you, I mean. Plenty of mistakes too. Don't worry mm. about that. I do make plenty of mistakes, and and a lot of things that I've put horses in wrong races, and I've regretted it, and I've given the wrong instructions to jockeys, and I thought, oh no, that was the wrong thing to do today. You know, halfway through a race, you long for a you know for a little loudspeaker. Would you ever please do this or that? But mm. you know, you've got it in the end. You've got to trust, trust your instinct, trust your jockey, and trust your ju judgment of where you're going and what you're doing. But you know, it's. I couldn't tell you exactly what my strongest point is. I have no idea. Well, thanks a million for your time. Really wish you the best in at the weekend and obviously in Royal Ascot as well. And, and in winning derbies, King George's races in Australia, Hong Kong, Arcs. It's all ahead of you, I hope. Oh, yeah. We'll have to try. I'll have to keep, I have to keep going for a bit longer. Thanks a million, Jessica. Not See at you. all. Thank you. See you, Jessica. See you, Fran. This is On The Wire, Racing TV's podcast for the best racing previews in association with Bar One Racing.
yeah, Fran, she's a, I, I, she's a remarkable woman. I, I remember she was injured um, when Sizing John won the Gold Cup because she'd been out skiing and uh, she was, I think she had her hand in a cast that day. Um, then had a, a little cold brush earlier this year, which she probably will have a bit of a chuckle about because you can tell that she's still frustrated by all the restrictions. But I think she's just utterly inspiring. Um, and to what is she's probably in the woods for mid 70s now. And it sounds like she's only really getting, getting going as a flat trainer. Remarkable woman, um, looking after right for, for a number of years, a lot of success together, um, tough, fair, loyal, but uh, very driven. You've seen that. Wasn't that inspiring the last couple of minutes talking about, I want to win the Ark, I want to win in Hong Kong, Japan, you know, like there's no, there's no, everything's forward, looking forward, no looking back, you know, and that's, uh, that's what you need to get ahead, but it's a great way to look at life too, isn't it? Duke, I'm sure you drew some inspiration from that interview. I, I, I really did, Johnny, because they, I knew it, it, there was a story about her. I remember reading something, I think it was in the Rising Post, where she, she, she was married before and uh, it, the marriage wasn't walking. And she basically walked out of the house one day and just didn't, didn't, look, didn't look back, but went, went over to, to Ireland and started again. There's, mm. no way, there's no way I'd be able to do that. I just wouldn't get out of bed. I, so I'm inspired by it, but I don't think I'm actually going to do anything on the back of it because I just haven't got her positive ma- mental attitude and her resolution as well. Uh, the People involved in horses gen- generally tend to be very positive people, don't they? Because um, you, you have to be with all the setbacks. Well, I, could, I, I couldn't deal with that. I'd stick to renting horses in the form of backing them as opposed to owning or training them. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, Johnny Mac, uh, she, I, I don't know, I always like backing our horses, to be honest, as well. And they're fit and, you know, just you can just basically generally rely on them. I, I actually think she's, uh, I think she's a complete sporting icon in Ireland, which probably isn't really appreciated outside of the racing game. Yeah, I, she, as Fran said, I'd say she's no shrinking violet. Fran, mm. obviously, you rode for her. I'd say if you gave one of Stones of a ride, she, she'd give it to you. She... But it was all, it was always easier to meet in the parade ring after. The problem was if one race and you have to ring her and you know things that go wrong, you get a spew for about a minute telling you exactly what you are in four letter, uh, four letter words, and then it'd be all forgotten about. And uh, that's that's the key to them things. And uh, you know, she's uh, but tough but fair. And uh, once uh, whatever's got to be said is said, and that's the end of it. On to the next race. Yeah, she's got few brilliant clients now, hasn't she, Johnny? I mean, she's attracted massive owners from around the world. Absolutely, yeah. And like that was obviously was fairly evident straight away in the, the exotic kind of owners she was getting and the well-bred horses. And I, I, as you said as well, friend, the, the sibling of Alpha Centauri, um, it's exciting because she was an absolute superstar of a horse and um, she does have some nice ones to look forward to. She does say, you know, it only come to hand, it's interesting to say about the weather and everything. The quite in and out are swing on to the last 10 days and it seems we get more consistent results. Obviously, that winner will really appeal last night. A few two-year-olds showing up well and uh, I'd say they're only ready to make hay now from now on, the Harrington team. We have a, a bumper weekend in Ireland. Four cards, kind of a lot of handicaps, a lot of sort of not higher grade racing, but competitive stuff. Um, start with you, uh, John, on Saturday, down Patrick and Limerick to put your teeth into. Uh, yeah, one or two still out. That horse at Enda Bulger is an everlasting promise in the uh, the Martinstown or the uh, conditional jockeys race. He's running mm. 31 pounds lower over hurdles. It's his first run for a year or so, but he looks chucked in. And you'd imagine they might have Killarney in mind for him next month. And what other stood out to me, Oscar Tyne, framed by Gavin Cromwell in the handicap chase. He won a Clamel beginner's chase back in April. He's had a couple of runs over herders. He ran quite well behind Diary in the Martins Con final, but he's back over fences. He could be one, two, to be on the right side of. I'm going to give uh, one a Roy in the 445 uh, at Limerick um, as my main selection there. This is a horse that uh, has a hold on for first time. He's running really well. This is a little bit tricky, but I think there'll be plenty of pace on here. Fran, what do you like on the two, in the two cards on the Saturday? Hey, didn't look at down Patrick to be honest. I uh, just mm. concentrated on Limerick That's the spirit. Yeah. and uh, no, no point saying it any other way. <laughs> any other way, is there? Uh, the 410, the Virginian trained by Parry Roach, very interesting. A uh, beat in Wexford over hurls and a maiden hurl the last day. Um, might might not have just got home, but back in the flat off mark of 71, the Virginian in the 410, and in the last race. Uh, the 550, uh, my mile maiden number uh, number eight, Lord Luker, trained by Ken Condon, ran extremely well and debuted at Leopardstown, staying out to be fifth, I think it was, 
he's got a good draw in stall one and it looked between him and Ophaya trained by Jar Lions number 11. Juki. Yes, again, I didn't look at them, Patrick, either. Uh, Johnny cut my workload in half. So the only... Uh, uh, in, in this, <laughs> this is incredible. I mean, there are only two meetings. Ah, the, de- declarations, the declarations for this meeting were out on Thursday. 48 ah, hour declarations are there for a reason. Just to, to bear in mind, if you're listening or watching this show, we basically record this at 11 o'clock on a Friday, which does restrict us in terms of our options on Sunday. We essentially have half an hour max subsequent to the entries. The entries are fair enough. But half an hour max so, uh, after after declarations, look at two meetings, Don Patrick and Gordon. But Fran and, and Juki are so confident of their place in this podcast, despite having 24 hours to look at Don Patrick on Saturday, they simply didn't even bother. Juki, what do you Come like on. on Saturday? Thumbs out, guns out, Johnny. Now summer jumping for me. So, no other, <laughs> than, no other than, than this punk poet who I backed yes. on Monday in Gordon. So, the jockey didn't do anything wrong on him in, in Gordon. He was drawn 15, so you either have to go up or you have to pull back. He decided to go up, but he ended up being three wide. The horse slightly ran off the bend, got a bit hooked up with that gout he missed. Was John Murphy's horses, that, that gout he missed is in rare form. I was following up from a win earlier in the week. Probably decent form. That was over seven furlongs. This is over, well, an extended six furlongs, but this horse really travels well in his race. So I don't think he'd have any problems with that. Draw nine, which isn't ideal, but I think he'd be, he'd be okay. I think he'd be able to see a better position than he was in Gorham. And, and I, th- I think he's just about handicapped to win. So on a weekend where I tried, I did try, but I struggled, Punk Poet was the one I liked. You tried to an extent. Did you try on Sunday then two more cards, one of which I presume you ignored, but although to be fair, you only had half an hour to look at this. Yes, and I mean, I haven't even, I haven't even got the decks in, so uh, there was no point in me looking at um, at Gorham. But the, but 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 that winner's race, I was interested to see that Cormorant is still in training with Joseph. Uh, yeah, he's owned, mm. he's owned by by Lloyd Williams, but they, they must be thinking about this horse as a potential Melbourne Cup horse. This is a good race, to be fair. This is the Thomastown race, named after yeah. Thomastown, the local uh, town, Balia Vigandon, 4.30, 4.30 at Gorham, Duke. Yeah, so it, I mean, it is a good race in fairness, Johnny. And it's the four year olds taking on the three year olds, which we like. But I just thought Cormorant, that's good form last year. He won first time out, so he should be all right fresh. He was fourth in the Dante, fourth behind Tiger Moth on Irish Champions weekend. Thought he might just outclass these. And you got to be thinking, Fran, he's going to, you know, remember him winning at Leopardstown, basically bossing it from mm-hmm. the front. Uh, that sort of tactic again, Fran? I would have thought so around Gorham Park and uh, if the ground stays good or even a bit better, it's Sunday they're forecasting good barbecue weather, aren't they? So it's mm. uh, it should be drying out. Um, Gorn, that winner's race definitely worth watching to 4.30. The 5 o'clock is a cracking Philly's maiden. There's any one of five that could win that climate. Hazia, Ulster Blackwater and Woodland Garden and Vario. Um, definitely a race to watch. My one that I like most on Sunday though, Johnny, is in the 2 o'clock. Handman trained by Joseph Ryan. I like a horse on the back, a very good run at the Curra, and that will give us a line on some possibilities for Ascot next week. Of course, he was third behind Dr. Zenf, trained by Ger Lyons, who goes to railway stakes. Very, very impressive horse. We spoke about him last week. Elliptic is possibly going to Ascot. That was second. Hadman was third. A missing matron, a winner was fourth. Hadman, seven furlongs going around the bench. It suited him well, and I think he'd take beating in the first. Three horse in that race uh, by Churchill, actually. One out of Cassandra Gold, trained by Geraldine. I, I, I love these two-year-old maidens where you have, you know, these, these horses rocking up representing stallions that are trying to prove themselves and so on. Who's impressed you so far of the juvenile stallions, Fran? Uh, we spoke about Churchill, beautiful looking horse. He got his first winner at uh, Listow last week with the uh, Croplips winning well. And he was well backed at the car on debut. Probably the ground caught him out. Um, he, Churchill, is has been touched well. Um, Glenn Eagle says it's not first season in Stallion, but he seems to get in a few more winners. And after that, it's it's early days. Obviously, you have profitable. Uh, mm. See what happens in Royal Alaska with his progeny next week as well. Uh, what do you like on Sunday, Mac? Johnny Mac? Oh, there's a couple there. I want to flag up a filly of Joseph's, Sincerest, who's part owned by Sue Ann Foley and John mm. Magner. That's after being doubly uh, declared. It's declared for Limerick Saturday and Gore and Sunday. Maybe you can read into that. And there's a mm. horse of Jim Draper's called Shopping Around, that mare. She got a seven-pound rise for her course win the last day. And they've put on that Pally O'Hanlon. He's a good claimer. His claim will offset the penalty picked up. I think she'll be hard to beat at Downpatrick. 
uh, just before we get to our weekend naps, lads, very briefly, got a, ask got nap. I, I'll, I'll go with mine. Uh, it's a Philly train by Aidan O'Brien, yet, uh, Y E T. Um, he did mention the Queen Mary the other day. I hope she goes for the Albany. She won in uh, Dundalk, beating a Philly of Donica's, what well, does well touted Orinoco River. Uh, Miles cleared the third, and uh, she's about five. You're talking about Alpha Centuri. This filly is as big, she's 500 kilos plus, and I think she's a real deal, Johnny. And uh, she's by Warfront, close ears, Dukey, but uh, I think he yet is uh, a very promising filly, and I, I'm quite excited by her. Yeah, I was told about uh, Wesley Ward has sent it over. Lucci, I think, is the name of the horse in the Norfolk that won first time out. Keep an eye out for that. Dukey, what's your Royal Ascot tip at the moment? Well, just a point of order as well. I love Warfronts, Brad. They're such beautiful looking horses. It's a boy, Ward. He, 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 we were nearly getting ah. decent the assist less letters off Claymore <laughs> Farm. The abuse, the abuse. He was, it was on a weekly basis. He just said, oh, I backed this Warfront and it didn't win. You know, but anyway, uh, so uh, yeah, I could definitely see that Philly in the Queen Mary. Uh, if I had to have a nap, Johnny, well, it, it's probably Sonina, but I'm not sure she's going to run. So I'll wait to see if, if, she, if she gets out of it. But a sound runs in the Britannia on Wednesday. Now, he's favourite. He's only he's only about nine to one. But I could see him going off half that price. Unexposed horse for Chrisford, second in the Britannia last year. Well cleared. He was well beaten, granted, but by a proper horse. He was well cleared at third. Had two runs this year. It's been beautiful work. They've got done just enough to get him into the race. Still has loads of upside. Has the course for him. I, I, I think the nine to one is value because I, I could see him going off five or six to one. So find a sound in the um, in that Royal Hong Cup. Any of you remember the band Manson being a girl and all that? Um, maybe not. Oh. Any of Yeah, do you remember them, Juki? Were they were, were, were they blonde? Were they they, they they an old blonde band? Um, well, they were blokes, so I'm, yeah, um, yeah. maybe they were. Am I might think of Hanson. Hanson. Yeah, that's Hanson. Manson and Hanson. Manson had a song in which the lyrics were I will always disappoint you because I'll always let you down. Oh, and that's Warfront. <laughs> <laughs> Johnny Mac, did you have time to get an ascot nap there? Um, I saw a, a horse at Gosden's, a juvenile at Gosden's win at Leicester there recently, a horse called Debab. He beat a juvenile of Archie Watson's called Sweeping, and he did it really easily under hands and heels riding. He was quite taking on the day, and he might take a bit of beating in the Coventry if he pitches up. Beautiful. Um, and yeah, we'll be interested to the Irish challenge in the Coventry as well. Let's get to the naps this weekend, starting with you, Juki. I'll go, I'll go for a uh, punk poet in the 225 in Limerick tomorrow, John. Uh, yeah, Fran. Saturday, Fran. I'm going to take a chance on the Virginian in that 410 handicap. I think uh, he should have won in uh, the rain, got into the ground in Wexford. It just f- caught him out last half furling stamina wise. He's very interesting off a mark of 71 back on the flat uh, tomorrow in the 410. Declan McDonough booked to ride. Yeah, I'm going to take on Sincerest um, in the. Uh, actually, we should be going to you, Johnny Mac, first. Let's get to you. I'm going to put up Jim Draper's mare shopping around. I think she'll win in Del Patrick on Sunday. Well, I'm going to take on Sincerest in the 445 that Johnny Mac mentioned. Those colours are always kind of the Sue, the Sue Ann Foley colours. Um, you're always interested to see will there be a few quid for the horse Sincerus. But uh, Sideshow Bob is a hold-up horse in the race. It's the 445 at Limerick. Uh, Cosman is probably going to be ridden forward by Jamie Powell uh, from gate 14 but the, I think the crucial thing about this race is there are 16 runners and uh, Owner Roy just cannot be out of the four if he settles at all in the hood loads of ability this horse and just a question of Ronan Whelan maybe getting the, getting the actual best out of him because uh, he is a little bit tricky lads uh, after this weekend off to, off to Edna Bryan's for the afternoon and uh, I'm in Limerick tomorrow so quite exciting times and barbecue on Sunday I'd say that's, that's a hell of a trifecta Juki Edna Bryan's into Limerick into a barbecue yeah I, I, I can't compete with that I, I, I'm going for a swim after this uh, and then I'm probably not going to be doing anything uh, I'll be getting ready for Ascot I just want to get myself centred for Ascot massively biggest week of the year right yeah will you, will you cycle your bike to the beach Juki is it fixed yet or yeah, it is, no, it is. Yeah, it, 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 it's it's on the way home, so um, I, I I have a bit of a sweat on, and then I'll just dive in the sea, and I'll be brand new. 
that that's uh, that is actually a nice double the to, to see in the cycle and and in fairness johnny mac he is a man from another era where he thinks you can go to a bike shop and get your bike fixed for a dicky diver effectively yeah uh juki you may come out for a spin with us i think me and johnny are going to plan a long ride some sunday we might drag both of them along too johnny yeah be well yeah. up for that yeah juki yeah yeah, I, I think I'll be like one of those lads in the Tour de France who joins in for a kilometre to get himself on, <laughs> on, the, on the TV cameras. That'll be me. But uh, best of luck with that project, lads. That was on the wire. Uh, massive thanks to Jessica Harrington, despite her aversion to technology, who was obviously the star of the show. Uh, enjoy Ask Us. It's going to be a cracking week, and we'll be back on On the Wire next week. Thanks also to Juki, to Fran, Johnny Mac, and Bar One Racing. Thank you for tuning in to On The Wire Racing TV's podcast uh, brought to you in association with Bar One Racing. And if you enjoyed the show, don't forget to leave a review. Uh, give us a like and subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. And this podcast is available on video format in all its glory on YouTube. And you'll also find us on RacingTV.com and on audio at Apple Podcasts, Spotify and numerous other platforms. Uh, don't forget if you are having a bet this weekend following any of our selections and so on, Gamble responsibly and do visit begambleaware.org for more information.